if you are in the labor room and a patient comes in the labor room if you're posted there i don't know all of you who've joined whether you are uh, post graduates whether you're first year second year i am not too sure which year you're in but this is relevant for anyone whether you're a resident uh, junior resident or senior resident and in turn um it is uh, similar for everyone this presentation is very important also because there's so many changes that are happening with respect to um uh, everything in fact in medicine in its entirety and even in obs and gyne if you see what we used to practice 20 uh, i passed out in 2009 so 15 years back and what we used to do in the labor room then to what changes have happened now and so many changes have happened so it's a very important topic um what do you do and we'll be discussing a lot of practical points we'll also be discussing uh what the who recommendations say so in 2018 the who came out with a uh, intrapartum guideline a uh, care guideline where again so many things were changed and uh but still we get to see those changes in actual clinical practice so let's discuss a bit more. So when a patient comes, and I'm talking about laboring patient, not the other emergencies, when a laboring patient comes in the labor room, what is the first thing you do? The first thing you do is, of course, you're going to take a history and an examination, do an examination, and you're going to determine whether she is truly in labor. So in the history, and you can go through the clinical class on this, you, in the history, you will take her detail, uh, whether she's booked patient or unbooked. If she's a booked patient, she will have the ANC card, which most places will have. Okay, so all her details can be gathered from there. Whether she is term or preterm also has to be looked into or maybe post-term. So once you've taken the history and once you've examined her, you basically determine if she's in true labor or false labor. That's the first thing you need to do. Okay, true labor is going to be associated with cervical dilatation and effacement. So you will see uh, uh, cervical changes because if she's in true labor. And true labor, uh, another important thing with true labor is that the pain, we all know this, it's it's more of an undergraduate level teaching now, which I'm coming down to, but it's very important to understand that true labor, the pain is going to increase in intensity, in severity, in frequency as time passes on. False labor will come and go. There is no fixed uh, time to false labor. Also, true labor pains are going to um, uh, persist despite giving her an enema, despite sedating her. They're going to persist. And true labor is going to, so it persists. It's going to increase in intensity, frequency, and uh, duration. And also, very importantly, they could be associated show. What is show? Show is that mucor, mucus plug, which is expelled once the cervix starts dilating and that is a blood mixed mucus plug because when the cervix dilates there is stretching of capillaries and they break down so some blood mixed mucoid discharge will be there so that's the first thing we need to determine based on the history and also on the examination the abdominal examination you look for contractions a vaginal examination see the cervical changes and determine whether she is in true labor or not. Okay, so now coming to examination. Now, examination of a patient in labor is very important. Okay, and apart from the general examination and her vital signs, which are, of course are very important, we also should always examine the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. You may detect an un, un, earlier undiagnosed, say, mitral stenosis. So always don't neglect the CVS and RS examination. You may be picking up, and this has happened many times with me, you pick up a heart disease at the time the patient comes into labor. So it's very important to have a, to a complete examination, even if she's been examined in the antenatal period. Now, when you do an abdominal examination, there are a few things you're going to look at. You're going to look at, number one, the height of the uterus. Is it a term uterus? So height of the uterus is important. You're going to do the Leopold maneuvers when the uterus is relaxed and determine the lie and presentation of the uh, of the fetus. Okay, you're going to auscultate the fetal heart rate. Okay, and also in the second Leopold, uh, the second pelvic grip, that is the fourth Leopold maneuver, you also determine the station of the head no in not not in terms of the vaginal valor station in terms of fifths of head palpable 
So fifths of head palpable, and we're talking about cephalic presentation, obviously, here fifths of head palpable has to be determined. Now, this is a very important concept to understand for several reasons. One is in the labor care guide or even the old modified partograph, we always talk about descent of head in terms of fifth of head palpable. So if all your five fingers are able to palpate the head, then it is five fifth palpable. As the head starts going in, it successively becomes four fifth, then three fifth, then, then two fifth, and finally only one finger can palpate the head and then zero fifth palpable. So why is this important? Because it is determining the descent of head. So when somebody asks you, how do you look at descent of head in the, uh, in the partograph? It is by abdominal examination. It is not by seeing the station of the head with respect to ischial spine. So it is descent of the head on abdominal examination. Second thing, when does engagement happen? When the head is one-fifth, and this is a little controversial, some places will say two-fifth palpable per abdomen. So one-fifth to two-fifth palpable head per abdomen when the head is engaged. Okay, that means the biparietal diameter has crossed the pelvic brim. And third thing which is important to understand in palpation of the fetal head is that you can apply an instrument. So instrumental delivery, forceps or vacuum, the head should not be palpable per abdomen. That is one of the main criteria when you are putting a forceps or a vacuum. So that's why the fifths of head palpable is an important concept. Okay. Then we see the fetal heart rate. Now, the fetal heart rate, 90% of the times you're going to auscultate it on the left um, spinal umbilical line. Okay. And uh, uh, that's because the most common position is a left occipital anterior position. So that's important. So first the position, apart from the heart rate and rhythm, which is also important, we also see where is it, where are you able to auscultate this? This gives us a huge clue. Okay. It also tells us which side the back of the baby is. Okay, and that determines which side the occiput is. So it's basically telling you where the occiput is. Today morning we had a delivery where in the morning when I came, uh, the patient came at night yesterday. So when we I saw her yesterday, the fetal heart was on the right side. Okay, and uh, because it was a busy day, it completely um, skipped my mind. And then when I got called that the patient was fully dilated, I went and she was exhausted from bearing down. So we had to put a vacuum and take the baby out. And that time I felt the occiput was um, posterior, but I wasn't very sure. And it came out as a phase two pubis baby. So remember, right, if you're oscillating the fetal heart on the right side, always in your mind think it could be an occipital posterior because ROP is more common than ROA. Okay, so and LOA, of course, is the most common, but any right sided fetal heart you're getting, start thinking of occipital posterior. In fact, I told my resident, okay, this might be occipital posterior yesterday. The morning was a different resident on duty. So when you put the vacuum, it came out as a face to pubis. So my um, uh, thinking was correct. So it raised my suspicions for an occipital posterior because I could oscillate the head on the, the fetal heart on the right side. So these are small, small pointers which. Uh, when you practice, we'll, we'll, um, you, you will re remember some of them. So this is abdominal examination. Then comes the vaginal examination. Now, when I do a vaginal examination, many of you have asked me, ma'am, how do we know the cervical dilatation? How do we see the cervical length? So on a PV, you're going to see several things. Okay, the first thing is, of course, you're going to see the cervical dilatation. Now, this, of course, comes with practice. And... Uh, years of practice so it's not something which I can just teach you in one class okay and by doing PVs repeatedly especially with a senior with you you'll be able to understand or or confirm whether your dilatation is correct or not so when you when, when I say the cervix is one many people say one finger two finger before she's three centimeters we use the term one finger two finger so one finger usually corresponds to one centimeter two finger corresponds to two centimeters so you have some idea what one centimeter what two centimeters Three centimeters when you can is, is something like a two finger loose sort of situation is three centimeters. Okay. And then beyond that, you have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Now, this is completely subjective and it comes with practice. It's not something which I can teach you over a class. I can teach you only if you're with me in the labor room, examining a patient along with me. So try to do this with your senior so you have some idea. But it's very important to see the cervical dilatation.